everybody. Welcome a bit again to A Cosmic Cuppa with Jude on 5D and Beyond. Tonight, I would like to introduce you to a wonderful woman called Sylvia Rands, who's joining us. He looks absolutely gorgeous today. Hello, Sylvia. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, Jude. That's wonderful. So today, we're going to be looking at the voice and sound. And Sylvia, I'd love to read out your bio to start with. Sylvia started working in the theatre while at university doing a BA. And when she graduated, went straight into her first professional theatre job at 19 years of age. She has always been passionate about transformation and the human ability to change and update ourselves and our lives. It was clear that voice was a big part of being an actor, and in the voice classes, she had regularly, I'm going to read it in first person, we had regularly learnt the basics of clarity and vocal fitness. Later, I was to understand the voice as the core of the actor's craft and relevant for every person as it allows a framework for this very transformation and updating. Ten years later, I travelled with my husband and child to England and then I went on to Boston to study with a respected voice teacher, Kristen Linklater who was teaching as part of Shakespeare and Co's summer school. I arrived exhausted and very tense. My jaw was rigid in voice classes, having worked in a theatre rep system for 10 years, rehearsing one play while performing another at night. I was also pretty over theatre, disillusioned by the lack of direction and the favouritism in New Zealand theatre. I left inspired, reborn, having fallen in love not only with a whole new understanding of the role of the voice in the actor's creative process, but with Shakespeare. I began to teach voice on my return to New Zealand and created a solo show using text from 14 Shakespeare plays called Such Such Sweet Thunder, which toured New Zealand over the coming years and was a wonderful experience. Being received with open hearts everywhere, I travelled. It was a powerful piece about a woman's journey through life, so it combined three of my passions, voice, Shakespeare, and championing the voice of woman, nowadays the divine feminine. My marriage broke up at the exact time my show was born, so I was plunged into deep self-examination, which led to a deepening of my spiritual path. I attended more and more courses of spiritual study and personal development. And a few years later, my life was transformed once again when I met a young couple at Mana Retreat Centre teaching a Healing with Sound workshop. I had been frustrated with the work I was teaching as it only involved the speaking voice and I felt that a, fully, a full understanding of the voice would have to include the singing voice as well. I recognised this method of sound healing as my path, thoroughly researched over 15 years by its originator, Gisela Romert, and the most profound system of training I've ever encountered. I completed the training over the next two years and then had the difficult task of integrating this profound spiritually based anatomical work with the work I was currently teaching in drama schools in Australia. 
I had been teaching voice classics to the public and actors and to women's groups at girls' high schools and to the wider public and eventually took up faculty voice teaching positions at Unitech in Auckland, BCA in Melbourne, Actors Centre in Sydney and back to Toi Fakari in Wellington in 2005. My healing work began at the end of the Healing with Sound training, as we were working with putting frequency into each other bodies. And suddenly I could see whole stories in people's bodies. My clear audience kicked in. I had always been an empath, but this was a whole new level. I began to work with friends and eventually found a form of a two-hour energetic healing session. I have been told this work has been given to me directly by spirit and is a unique modality, which I won't necessarily be able to teach. However, in my workshops and through receiving sessions themselves, people and other healing practitioners are stimulated in a way that is appropriate for their personal development. Se trauma of sexual abuse as a child. I've had to work through my own trauma and learn my own healing pathways. Being silenced is at the core of my work and I seek to help all those who wish to find their voice again after such silencing. I am a mystic at heart and a follower of the mystery schools, which includes the alchemy that exists within theatre, art and literature, and also in the ancient knowledge of the Indian Vedantas, indigenous teachings, Buddhist practice, the teachings of Christ. I have had past experiences of lives in Lemuria, Atlantis and many galactic civilizations. I have learnt to work intuitively and in deep trust when I teach both private sessions, healing sessions and workshops. I am in constant contact with my guidance teams working through my higher self so that I can work with and channel ascended masters my galactic and angelic teams and lineages, whoever needs to be present. I currently run a galactic circle and work with where I live, which introduces people to the energy of light language, which I have been working with in my deeper healing sessions for about 10 years. That is some bio, Sylvia. Yes. Thank you so I didn't much. I expected you to read it out. That was just background material. <laughs> <laughs> it was brilliant. That was very Absolutely cool. brilliant. <laughs> so, how are you this evening? I'm great. Yeah, I'm good. I've had a good day. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Would Would you like to start, please, by? telling us a little about what your life was like as a child and how your being silenced affected you. Uh, I didn't know I was being silenced because um, I didn't get my uh, recall on my sexual abuse experience till I was in my mid-30s. So um, I had a wonderful childhood Um it was a classic New Zealand childhood. Um, I had a large family. I was the youngest of five kids. And, uh, you know, my father was a built boats and um, we had a wonderful time on, on the land. We lived in an outer suburb of Auckland, which was quite country-like in those days. So a lot of time on the land, a lot of time on the sea. Um, in retrospect, of course, I realised that uh, those things sort of, really kept me alive because um of course these layers of distress were actually underneath as from the age of six um so 
yeah, you know, the sea is still my 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 most healing place uh, based on those times and that experience and um, that it is, uh, you know, the rock, <laughs> the rock that's traveled with me through the years. So, um, and of course my work's very much about the water element and, and the flow of feelings. So that's always, that links in there too. Um, yeah, so I think I was very held by the, the family environment and, and um, uh, you know, it's funny, isn't it? We have these myths about our childhood, you know, and that's one of the things, isn't it? When we, when these, uh, for other people who've had late discovery of trauma in their life, you know, it's like um, when everything you knew cracks apart and you have to reset the jigsaw, you know, and, and uh, you go on a hunt to put all the pieces of your mm -hmm. life together and go, oh my God, that was what was actually happening. And, you know, that, uh, so it was very like that for me. And, you know, I realized I was actually quite, uh, even though it was a big family, I was quite solitary growing up because I, of course, I was so much younger than everybody and, and they were pretty busy doing their own lives. And mum, of course, had had 17 years of childbearing because, you know, it was a big five years between us all. So she was ready to bolt the minute I got to school age. So she was off um, into the workforce as soon as she could be. So, um you know, I became a sort of a bit of a latchkey kid, really. But that suited me, it suited my temperament. I never thought of it as a bad thing. I mean, we just do this. It gave me lots of freedom and I was pretty into my study. So I just got on with stuff, you know. But, uh, yeah, I I think, um, I mean, we, we uh, it's funny, isn't it? I don't think, what, what, that's an interesting question you've asked. I'm sure when my brain clicks clicks on, I will have, more insightful answers about what that silencing actually did. But um, I think the whole point about uh, trauma, and especially when it comes from, um, you know, uh, the uh, sort of virgin soul, the travesty to the, to the, to the untouched soul and the, the to purity and innocence, which is what happens when children are um affected in this way is that it, it, it goes so deep into the being um that you know here I am at the age I am now and I'm still you know I, I like to think I'm on my last layers but uh it has literally taken all this time of quite constant uh work and um willingness to engage certainly since 35 when, when the memory surfaced um uh yeah so sorry, spirit saying shut up. That's that's a that's a <laughs> sign. That's a sign when I run out of things to say and not to get a full stop. That spirit saying enough of that, enough of that. Okay. Right. <laughs> I I think you're quite right. And I was talking to friends and family today about do we ever totally heal? I think at times we can, but at times it is a lifelong journey, isn't it? And it can take us a lifetime to unpeel more layers of the onion absolutely and you know I'm really thinking and uh I've just this sort of work and things I've heard this week and listened to this week uh and it's about this amazing portal we're in at the moment with November and um the fact that um as I'm sure many are feeling you know this these core energies our core fragments of unhealed energy are coming up for many and certainly many of my clients. And uh, because it's such a powerful time, they can actually come up and be cleared very quite powerfully and efficiently at the moment, which just blows my mind because these things used to take years. Uh, but the energies are so high at the moment that these incredible shifts can happen. And um, it's this time to shadow up these last fragments of shadow but ultimately, you know, I think um, somebody I listened to last night said, ultimately, the lesson of November is, you know, are we willing to leave the old structures behind and are we ready to move into the new earth? And uh, and um, do you choose pain or do you choose the miracle? Uh -huh. And this says everything for me because I have bad knees at the moment, which I, I, I see as ultimately well sort of being genetic and in the the family line but also probably linked to this sort of some level of 
crippling that goes on on some level. And uh, and I thought, yeah, so it's like I'm daily living with the pain, but I, I live with it really pretty well in the sense that it doesn't bring me down emotionally all that much. You know, I, I just sort of, I do my inner work and I work with all, all my healers and my teams to heal me as much as possible. And even though I am looking for the big miracle healing, I, I'm hoping... It is about do I choose pain or do I choose the miracle really on a daily level. And I think at this point when we do choose the miracle, I think this might be the portal actually where we get to really release the wound. Beautiful. Yeah. So be yeah. it. I think, I think so that's where it. we're going. Yeah. It mm -hmm. certainly is a very high energy month with lots of changes mm -hmm. and, as you say, um, shadow self work coming up to the surface to be looked at do I deal with this now or do I not? And mm. it's the choices. Mm. It's it's the crux time, isn't it? Where you've got the crossroads. Mm -hmm. What what do I choose? Which way do I go? Where do I choose to focus my attention and my intention? Yeah. All of those things. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you would like to please tell us a little about your move into the world of theatre, which sounds so exciting on some levels and I'm sure well you can tell us how it is for you or was for you how that opened up your creativity and learning to vocalize with clarity and projection pushing through the boundary of having been silenced or maybe you weren't aware of that part at that stage as you said you maybe didn't recognize that until later but could you talk about that please and your your move into the the world and work of theatre and what made you decide to go down that path oh I don't think it was much of a decision I was casting plays at high school and I think it was fairly destined all that um you know things just literally sort of fell in my lap and I did them and you know, I had to share a role with somebody once when I was 16 and I ooh, a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth as the ego was had my first experience of complete ego shattering, which continued quite regularly over the next 10, 20 years. Um, as it does, it's one of the initiations that theatre offers you. And um, yeah, it, it is a beautiful world. For me, I always wanted to uh, be, you know, what I would call a transformative actor. It was, uh, you know, coming out of the 50s and 60s, you know, uh, you know, we were taught the craft of the actor, which isn't sort of such a big deal these days, sadly, I don't think, but um, which was you did body work, you know, the idea was that you went to drama schools and uh, you went in with all your personal tics, etc. And then all the great theatre teaching teaching books always talk about the neutral body. So the idea is that you, through your teaching, with with the core crafts being body work and voice, and you um, learn to sort of divest your personal ticks so that you can achieve what's called the neutral body. And it's a, for me, it's a little bit like sort of zero point these days in the healing world, which is the goal, the goal that we have these days. So, um, and then from that place of the blank canvas, then you can create. And and this is where, um, for me, you know, the joy of Shakespeare was very profound when I discovered it. And because when you're working with great words, the power of great language, and I was lucky at university, I studied great literature. So I've always had, uh, you know, the words of masters rolling around inside me. And, um, you know, they bring out, they drop into the body. And because they're just frequencies, uh, you know, they can awaken and elicit very profound things. And so, I mean, my experience being an actor and watching my students that I've taught over the many years is that great purging can happen through a role. It's no accident the roles, the roles that the universe provides for every for every actor. And often there are the most ridiculous parallels to to one's real life or or not, you know, um, but it, it, for me, because I always had that overview of, oh, that's amazing. You know, once I did start getting that overview of, oh, you know, 
especially looking back at my roles once I got more into my healing work and I thought oh how amazing you know that role taught me that and that role taught me you know the power of love and that role taught me you know um whatever how to fight etc you know I remember in my training in America um it was a the first training was a month-long residential and we had to prepare pieces and I I took a piece uh, and I did one of the old battle axe queens and I was 29 at the time and they said oh that was lovely darling wonderful but why did you choose that piece and I said oh I never get to play anybody under you know you know I, I've never been cast as a juve in my life and that's partly my body type and, and 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 so of course they immediately gave me Juliet didn't they so I had to live as this 14 year old uh for you know the next month and uh and it was very amazing and through the voice I did find the portal in a particular voice class with with the teacher Dennis I found a portal into the right vocal range that opened the heart of Juliet and um yeah my life transformed it was just my heart opened because it's the heart range of the voice and uh, my husband was in England at the time looking after our son and I rang him that and I said, I'm sorry, I think we're going to have to get married again because I think I've never really understood love until, <laughs> until I spoke Juliet's lines and and, uh, and the energy moved through me. So, yeah, it's a great gift. That was, yes, that is quite remarkable. Mm. And taking on the character of that person uh, mm. maybe part of that soul fragment of the idea of that person from a writer or that person maybe comes through too. Would you agree with that? Uh, oh, yes, it does. Yes, yes. I, I, yeah, I sort of made a joke to my students over the years of, you know, you've got to sort your protection out because, you know, for me, you know, living functionally did get a little bit tricky. I mean, I wasn't really aware of it, but you know, carrying two rolls around at a time as as we were doing, um, and I and, and I joked, you know, that it was you know it was great, great for the husband if you were playing a whore or a loose woman, but you know, apart from that, you were a little bit sort of, you know, um, untouchable or very preoccupied in the internal spaces, you know, because you were carrying these frequencies. So, yeah, I mean, that was part of what America was about for me in my training and especially my healing sound training was understanding uh, the levels of protection needed. And just for me, you know, perhaps, I mean, I do feel for everybody, but people have different views on it, I know. But um, for the sanity of the creative, I think that it is quite a useful practice to disconnect from our um, whatever energies we're drawing, drawing on and yeah. drawing in to do our creative work, yeah. I have a very simple question for you, which I think may have a very deep answer. How important is the voice? Uh -huh. Well, the voice is pretty big and it's this time in history, it's immense because of what I was talking about earlier, which is that um, the voice is actually, in terms of the human being, it is our primary vibrating body and as we know, and as we talk about a lot, um, frequency and vibration are um, the healer, the healers of the present time. You know, I've been carting around a book for years, you know, saying, you know, music is the medicine of the soul or music is the medicine of the future. And we know that music heals the soul. It does. And, uh, and, and, and the work I do is a little bit more specific. It's 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 going specifically in into the individual psyche, etc. But um, the voice is frequency, and the voice is physical. And as a healing modality, the reason why voice is so powerful is because it is a cleanser. You don't need words always uh, to get the results. You can use tone and sound. The energy of sounding out a pure tone from the body um, is a great cleanser and releaser. But most specifically, uh, what is not moving, these fragments that are uh, coming at the moment, these are the frozen parts of ourself. And 
so frequency and vibration will shatter and get moving these frozen aspects. So uh, the basic concept of the voice that uh, I work with is that, you know, we all have a one to three and a half or four octave vocal range. And if you visualize that like a ladder, that's a sort of a pretty 2D image of it. I mean, I have other 3D images I use, but um, just if you just conceive that you have this range and before you really start thinking about your voice or exploring it, most people only sit at about one and a half octaves of that. And uh, and that can often become quite ego identified. So stories develop like, um, I have a soft voice or I have a very loud voice or, you know, um, oh, I, I have great difficulty doing this or doing that. And that's entirely and totally understandable because we've never been taught that there are, I mean, in the arts trainings, of course we have been, but, but people who, where it's not, normal even though we all have a voice so you know it's beneficial to all of us to know about it um is to understand that we can vibrate with more of ourselves so the parts of this range that haven't been used or have been covered and we call that rust rusted over and usually this happens through trauma, the most rusted bits, and often they are the higher part of the voice, which is the child range of the voice. And uh, so in getting the rust off, we are reclaiming the parts of ourself that um, haven't been vibrating for a while. And this is done in a, the key to voice work is that this is a physical embodied experience. And as we all know, there are many, many trainings and especially in the new age world and where a lot of stuff is talked about and it may be up in the ethers, but, you know, we're in a time of devolution and we're about getting the spirit down into the body to awaken the cells of the body. And voice is really one of the most powerful ways, I believe, to do that. It's quite efficient in that way. Just to feel, because to make a sound, firstly, you have to breathe. And we know how popular and huge breath work is at the moment. And it's always been a, a staple, obviously, of, of voice work wherever it's taught in the world. Um, but breath is the fuel. If we don't breathe, we don't get sound and we don't make sound. And, um, and also if we don't breathe, we're holding all those frozen bits in place. So, you know, this is why even breath work on its own moves and unfreezes such a such a lot. Um, but then tone also um, has its own particular power to do with frequency and resonance uh, and awakening different parts of the psyche and different parts of the body. Um, so it's a very multidimensional tool. I don't really like using the word tool, tool but yes. <laughs> Yes, it does have that function, yeah. That's a beautiful answer, and it, it mm. gives a greater depth of understanding to people like myself that have not followed voice work as such, even though I do mm. like to yak. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. um, that resonance, which makes sense, Sylvia, doesn't it? Resonance mm. holds key to so many variables, including healing. And I liked the term you use of frozen emotion mm. and that it can be shattered or dissolved or however you see that happening with sound. Mm -hmm. And we know sound was used years and years ago and is coming back more and more now into its own right with frequency and vibration. Yeah. And one of the, you know, I, I had to tutor a French actor once who was here and he actually ran his, ran his own drama school in Paris. And he said, every day I get them to laugh and to cry, you know, and uh, and it's true because in the Lichtenberg training, in the sound healing training, uh, they have a body of work which is to do with the reflexes, which are a very deep um, intelligent system in the body. And the sob and the laugh are two of the deepest 
reflexes in the body that alone are responsible for huge layers of healing in the body. Mm. And of course, what is, you know, society done is it's demonized feeling and called it womanish. And, yes. um, and particularly and, for little boys or young men told not to cry. Totally. So it's heartbreaking to see these, you know, teenage boys who get suicidal, etc., and, and this, this sort of thing, because I, I can imagine why, if they've never, ever been able, given permission to speak yes. their feelings, they don't even understand there's anything there probably worth speaking about, you know, because it's... Um, but permission to to speak them, I mean, in my workshops, I always ask, you know, okay, which, who had, who, who, whose families had permission for anger and who's, you know, who had permission to cry? Because whatever we experienced when we were young, I mean, I don't, it's interesting when you ask, think about my own childhood, I'm trying to think, did I have permission for both of those? I think I was okay with the crying and I think my dad might have taken all the points up on the anger so I'm not sure but I think I responded by being equally angry back so I probably um, did get away with it whereas it might have more, more silenced some of my other siblings because he was mm. a bit gentler with it by the time I came along you yeah. mm. and every child has a different personality and reacts and re responds in different ways as well of course, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Would you mm. speak, please, about your time as a solo artist in New Zealand, touring, giving shows called Such Sweet Thunder? How was that such a powerful experience, talking about a woman's journey through life, combining the voice, Shakespeare, and championing the voice of women, raising self-empowerment and ultimately bringing in the divine feminine? Uh, yeah, I've done a couple of solo shows, actually. I, I really like the form, um, and it is very portable and transportable. And I did a whole year of doing house shows, actually, going to people's houses and doing a show. But it wasn't with the Shakespeare show, because the Shakespeare show had 72 lighting cues, which used to drive my technicians around the bend, especially when we toured the South Island and um, and the North Island, and they had to set it up every night. Nearly killed them, I think, poor guys. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, it was, it was, it was a beautiful-looking show. Um, I had a wonderful lighting designer and a wonderful team and um lots of energy and you know i was very physically fit and um it was just a very magical magical time yes i came back from my training in uh, america and i just reached back into new zealand at a time uh when the theaters had died the theater that i was on the board of and we were about to sign up for a new theater when i came back there was no board and no theater and then Mercury Theatre in Auckland died uh, sometime after that. So there was suddenly sort of no work. So I thought, oh, well, don't know if I was going to be a teacher or not, but let's find out. So I so I started teaching and, um, and out of that same sort of time, suddenly I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll create this. I think I finally got frustrated. Theatre is a lot about typecasting, you know, and so you tend to get cast according to what you look like. But of course, in your soul, if you think about finding a note on each one of those one to four and a half ranges, you know, we have so many dimensions inside us. And I think I just got really over being limited by waiting to be employed in a particular role based on, again, on what I was looking like or whatever. Whereas in, in this show, I could play, you know, many, many different ages of women and sorts of women, plus the men, Hamlet, who I'd always wanted to do. I mean, it wasn't as if I played the character. They were completely out of context of the shows. I wasn't, I didn't swap cosies and put on a funny voice each time I moved into character. It was just, I just used the words of the energies, really, of each of those characters. Um, but people who really would have known their Shakespeare would have would have been able to recognise those words, and I think that uh, hopefully that was enjoyable for some people who who were Shakespeare buffs to be able to find that. But uh, 
no yeah no I sort of ripped the guts out of it you know sorry Shakespeare but um and uh reframed it into a woman's story really and mm -hmm. uh, it was just a story from her um yeah from her youth and her innocence through to her um well rebirth as it turned out yeah wow. um, that's quite yeah. amazing and also do you think that in playing those roles that had the thread with that story that it was helping you as well in your understanding of you Oh, yes. Oh, definitely. Yes. I mean, the whole crafting of what was in and what was out and it was all a bit overwhelming. Actually, really, I mean, you know, I have Nick to Nick Blake to thank for that because he was my director at the beginning. And, and he said, oh, why don't we just do a meditation? Because I had all these ideas. And, you know, one of the curses of my life is that my very busy head can get in the way of my heart. And, um, you know, I could have spent months just, you know, getting to the guts of it all. And he said, let's do a meditation. So I lay down and uh, he led me and asked me questions. And I got I got the whole show along with what was in the wings, what was coming down from the ceiling, what was happening with, I just, just was downloaded into me in incredible wow. detail. And then we had um, the job of trying to get some version of what I had received up on, up on the floor. And, you know, it, 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 it did keep changing it's definitely one of the highlights of my life that time of creation yeah hmm. do you know where that information came from was it your higher self was it channeled through from someone or how did that work or do you oh, know I how so that worked aware. I wasn't so aware of specific guides I mean I've never been working I I, I work I, I'm I work pretty directly with source so I think um it would have just been a fairly clear yeah source channel I wouldn't have thought of it in that but I think that's artists and creatives when when we're really on form that, that's what I think they're doing yeah they're just absolutely energy yeah. absolutely yeah it totally yeah. makes sense because you're in that world of creation mm, mm, mm. you really are so yeah thank you mm. Can you speak about your deep feminine teaching you practiced at the, if I'm saying this correctly, Leistenberg Institute in Germany, and how that deepened your understanding of women's power to unfold their potential? Uh, yeah, sort of linking that. Yeah, the Leistenberg training um well, they came here to New Zealand and, and we did it down at Mana Retreat Centre. But I did go to Germany uh, in the, the years after my training. Um, yeah, it, it, sort of the way you asked that question was a little bit like, you know, we sort of hung around and had those sort of women talks and things, which is definitely what we didn't do because, um, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> Germany is is the home of you know the great classicists you know and um, uh, Gisela who who created this work she had she was a she was a warrior I I don't actually know I assume I hope, pray that she's still around um, you know I think then when I twenty years ago she was sixty with the voice of a thirty year old or a forty year old it was just extraordinary and she and her husband had researched this work but she was giving these talks at conferences about this extraordinary stuff that they had discovered about the human voice and you know that to be heard in that very structural mainstream environment if they were introducing um you know esoteric concepts they had to be so anchored in the anatomical and the science um, I mean, it's quite complex work. I mean, certainly lots of it, I keep saying to my students, lots of it I haven't taught. Um, but the main principles, or should I say the principles that did manage to connect with me were sufficiently life-changing. And I mean, one of those, I mean, I think I said to you when we chatted the other day that, you know, they did say that apparently one of Nostradamus's predictions was that there would be a new use for the human voice around the year 2000 and it was around about you know 1999 so that I was doing this study and they definitely thought that their research which had uncovered the power 
the healing power of high frequency in the human voice, they certainly believed that this was a whole new evolutionary layer for the human voice. And I certainly would think so. And um, uh, basically they had, would, uh, you know, at the Institute, they were all taught to sing and, you know, fairly classically, and they've all got these voices that go up and down the range without any glitches, just these flawless voices that go up and down. And they used to give concerts in their local castle, which was mm. uh, in, the, in the village, tiny little village. And then the villagers started uh, ringing them and saying, I don't know what you're doing at that institute, but last night my tinnitus was cured. Wow. And, uh, and in fact, they do work with a lot of um, clients with tinnitus, and uh, which, of course, they don't, uh, I don't think they really believe is a real thing. But anyway, they work with it. And because it's all about a very deep, deep, deep part of the training is about the true function and true power of the ear. The ear is actually where our sound starts. We think it's all here and, and or in the brain or in you know the actual uh, voice box, the actual larynx. The larynx is a master part of the body. It does about 38 things. It transmutes everything. It, it takes our lower frequencies and transmutes them to our higher frequencies. It clears toxins. It, it adjusts this, it adjusts that. It's, it's, it really is a master um, area, alchemist's part, pot, the larynx. And uh, which is why it has these great powers to shift energy, and um, and the ear likewise is is deeply linked. This sort of divine triangle here is uh, where the healing happens. This is, and of course, that was introduced to us and shown to us in diagrams, which I now share at my workshops. That it is, of course, a direct mirror. Uh, to the female reproductive system. So when you talk about the role of what is divine feminine in the voice, well, it is the structure of the voice is divine feminine. I mean, the masculine, of course, plays a role. I mean, vibration, I don't know, you could think of them as lots of little sperm, I suppose, vibration, but um, fertilizing <laughs> this, this, this female structure. Uh, but it's definitely about the sacred marriage. But the difference is is that whereas most other trainings and many trainings, as we know, uh, you know, taught sort of institutionally throughout the world, um, can be very left brain focused. And with all the trappings, you know, which is that, um, you know, a particular result is wanted and a particular way of doing it is necessary and all of those things we associate. And, you know, the goal is perfection, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, their training is deeply, deeply not that. It is, they would never teach a group. They teach uh, people one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I do teach groups, but certainly that's why I love the one-on-one -on -one healing work because each person is so deeply unique and each person's voice is so deeply unique. Um, and uh, it's all done through toning, toning a pure tone. So, and the tone is the voice of the right brain, basically. Um, it, it, it is created by the right brain aspect. Um, and so basically they've discovered that this integral sort of female structure in our body and, and in the vocal anatomy, this is the, the core, the impulse center for the voice and then all the beautiful definitions and dynamics and all the other shading and lifting all everything all the beautiful skills of the left brain that 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 can come in but it is this core connection to the body and to the earth and to uh the it, the body of energy which is emotion all these things, which are the divine feminine elements, um, 
actually I'm just thinking I don't know that if they taught that I think that's what I teach in my four elements voice work but uh, because I have blended everything but yes it is certainly um, the divine feminine which um, carries this great mystery of the voice. It's yeah. fascinating I had not realized that the ears played so much part but as soon as you mention that, it's like, of course, because we hear the sound with our ears and through our bodies with vibration, intuiting what's happening around us, but the ears hear. So it yeah. makes perfect sense. And there are yeah. so many tones and sounds and projections of voice in all its forms. Mm. And you work as a healer with the voice and would you like to talk maybe a wee bit about what you do and when you realized you wanted to set up vocal vision voice works how you release frozen emotions using your esoteric knowledge uh yes well my first study with Kristen Linklater was um you know, she's her marvellous work is called Freeing the Natural Voice, which I recommend for people who really want to get in deep and have some sort of good exercises and want to, you know, ha have stuff to practice. And it's just a wealth of information. Um, and beautiful. She was the one that, that really opened up this, how to crack Shakespeare open and, and get the emotional goodies out of that. But, um, but as I say, uh, it's specifically the musicality and that right brain work of of the of the Lichtenberg Institute that really. Um, so a marriage of these two systems um, seem to me to be um, certainly satisfied me in terms of I had plenty to teach and it seemed to be effective for the students and. And then when I got back to New Zealand after my time in Australia, I was teaching at Toy Fakari and I thought, yeah, actually, uh, there was a wonderful man teaching a system called the Four Elements, one of the directing students. And I thought, oh, wow, that's great, isn't it? Because my work's sort of all about that. And I loved it. And I thought, oh, I think, oh, why don't I create a framework for myself? And it would have been very handy if my 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 four element system had matched his, but unfortunately it didn't. Um, because um I thought, well, I better go back to the ancients. So I based mine on the Vedantas and the Shake Chakra system. And um and that's that's the one I work with now. And um and so basically instead of for me it's the challenge is to get our language into a right brain to for me I want to offer an experiential journey with the voice that's what so I teach workshops I teach private clients and I do private healing sessions and workshops can be for any you know well actually these days I don't work with such big, big groups but um you know uh or or smaller groups I mean I can cater to any amount I and mean, have taught tents full of 50 people I suppose at the, at the festivals uh and so that's quite fun too um so I developed the system because I wanted the elements uh to give to let people feel holistic to feel they were fully embodied and that they could you know and to get the senses online because the goal with our spiritual journey and this ascension journey we're on is that we have to activate the senses to get into our body the five senses and each of the elements that i work with each of the five elements uh four elements voice are linked to one of the five senses so as we get the rust off these notes we're also purifying the sense in our body and uh so our senses are becoming activated and balanced and at that point that that happens then of course our clear clears clears kick in our clear audience now clear sentience now clairvoyance so 
as we get through that first layer of just getting the body comfortable with making a variety of tones and giving the body permission to uh, feel something and then put it onto a sound because feeling is the key. The water element is the key. And uh, once this flow starts happening in the body, uh, then it's sort of in the cells of the body. And then we can start working on the higher, finer frequencies, which is more the Lichtenberg work, um, which is to do with the higher, higher frequencies that are available to us through more specific um, awakening in the ear and um, uh, understanding the qualities of vibrato in particular and brilliance, which are the two right brain qualities of the voice that are latent in all of us. And these are the high frequency aspects of the voice, which have a very um, uh, cleansing and transforming uh, power on the body when when these aspects come into our tones. Oh, beautiful. Could you talk a little bit, please, about the vendantas and the chakras, how you utilise that with your healing? Oh, yes. Well, I mean, basically, I just looked at how they, what their, one of their, their core structures were, and the chakra system was one of the core structures in the ancient Indian um so I just thought, well, I'll check out because I already had a feeling of where the elements were sitting in the body. So I thought, oh, I'll just see if what I'm feeling aligns to their chakras. And and it did in the sense that the base chakra is the is earth in that system and the sacral is water and the uh, solar plexus is fire and the uh, heart chakra is air. Yeah. And, and ether, of course, as we go on up and uh so um so i've been working with these elemental energies and uh teaching people and and people i, I think i mean unfortunately i really never got around to writing my book which would have made everything considerably easier for the many hundreds and thousands of acting students that i've taught if they could have gone through a book and read about it but um anyway it may still happen but uh uh, yes, I mean, I am going to do, a, I hope to do a training for for voice for teachers in this in this work um, starting Beautiful. next year. Beautiful. So, we'll look forward to so, when yes. this comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. You're a very creative being, delving into acting, craft and art. Could you mm. speak about these other two aspects of your life, craft and art? Well, the craft is just the word that we use for the theatre business, you know, the theatre craft, the craft of theatre, yeah, yeah. I mean, my sisters are all fabulous painters and weavers and and my father was a painter, so there has been certainly lots of... I grew up with plenty of beautiful crafting going on around me with, um, yeah, beautiful creativity. Um but I think my creativity, probably if I had, I mean, I am very happy when I am creating a, a theatre show. And I'm also very happy. I think I will probably, you know, be very happy on the days when I'm really on a roll with, um, you know, crafting workshops or, um, as, as I say, crafting crafting the um uh, you know the uh, the core of the training that I'll teach. I'm hoping that that will that it will trigger the same uh, creativity. Yeah. Mm. So in I mean, a way, yeah. Carry yes. on. Oh no, I mean, I mean, I'm in a time of transition at the moment because you know I have been very part of that uh, that world. It's always the the performing world and that world, and then I'm feeling that I am definitely you know moving more fully now into the my 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 healing life so yeah i i would like to call you a sound alchemist does that sit oh. with you yes i love that i think i think i i really feel that's is an accurate term yeah cuz what i'm yeah, sensing and... from you talking with you this is what's happening 
And maybe these are the times for these therapies to become more manifest because we are light, we are sound, and to utilize the voice, and we know how powerful that can be. And as I spoke to you earlier on, innately I knew, and I certainly don't know at all, that when I'd had a bad day, I would get in my car and I would sound that feeling of disharmony. And whether I was screaming it or growling it, and it didn't matter in a car because no one's going to hear you. And then when I felt that had done its dash, I would sound again to bring the harm, not to bring the harmony back, but to see how it resonated with me now. In a way, it was the healing key in sound. Totally. And so, I told you you were very advanced because that's exactly <laughs> don't know about that. what I ask uh, people in my workshop once they know how to tone and once they feel confident with that. That's exactly what I suggest. Use the car. The car is our friend. You can be as noisy as you <laughs> like on a motorway. And when you get the odd <laughs> shot, shot, you get the odd shot look at traffic lights. But, you know, apart from that, um, yeah, it's it's a it, it is, and you know, New Zealand we're lucky enough. Well, hard to get to these days, sadly, but you know, to have our wonderful beaches and 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 we can get into nature alone sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's it's one. I mean, I'm living in the country in the moment. I keep being totally surprised that sometimes the sound comes out of me somewhere in the house, and I and I and my thing is. And I'm still, you know, doing that thing of, oh, and then I think, no, <laughs> there is no one around. I can be as loud as I like. So it's, uh, yeah, very, I mean, like, there is there are actually people around, but they don't mind it. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. I very went, liberating. When I lived in England mm. for a while, I went to a soul sound workshop, which was yes. fascinating. And the instructor had a shruti box the indian tonal yeah. instrument mm -hmm. and we sounded mm. uh, different states that we were asked to and when we sounded a healing song for me the lady that had done her piece before me mm -hmm. felt that i had been healing her mm. with my sound which sounded very Maori, and I don't have Maori genetics, yeah. but I'm from this land. Yeah. And I found that fascinating. Do you I find this know. sort of thing happens oh, in your workshops? Yes. Oh, yes. I just, it's so, once you get down to the core, into this water element and, and the earth element and, and this this deep, it's like if you think of the belly as a portal to the subconscious, which it, which it is, and then we're entering the sound in there. We are opening up to all of our ancient indigenous memories. I mean, people say, "Oh, you sound like a Hawaiian healer or an Aboriginal healer," or I, you know, or, or you know, people hear different things in our sound for sure. And and I feel the frequencies of different um, energies and cultures coming through me on different times I mean I don't I've never spent a lot of time you know I'm not I'm not always getting the images or a sense of actually what I'm doing I'm just working intuitively um, but in Australia when I used to do some toning at a regular weekly gathering and um and a woman came up the end and she said oh thank you so much and I said oh wonderful and she said yes you've just uh, re reorganized all the tribes and relinked us all to our tribes and you've done this and you've done this and you've done this and I I, I mean I I really was unaware and uh, I mean uh, for me I just work with source and I I don't sort of need to know exactly um, I I'm I guess it's probably part of my learning this time around is that um, I have to work in trust and yeah. um and that can be hard if you don't have very neat explanations for things and all the groovy words to attach to what it is you're doing so um in a way anyway. it's out of linear isn't it 
Sylvia. It's out of linear timing, and it's it's yes. like this golden weaving, the warp and the it weft is. that is healing yeah. and joining and growing, and becoming yeah, more and that, more than the sum of its parts. Totally, and exactly what you said before, Jude, about what happened in that workshop for you, is yeah. that I just felt it in my last workshop. It was so moving. It was so moving. These sounds that were. You know, at one point we did this, we'd been working quite deep. I think we'd been actually working with some Hoponopono or something. And we all just, I think I must have, I gave a, you know, anyway, an impulse to make the sound. And we all hit exactly the same note in the moment. And honestly, the room, I know it would have been exploding at that point because, of course, it's, wow. you know, the power of the group. And, um and at that moment, of course, the level of healing that we are all offering each other through the body, through the being, is very amazing. And, I mean, I'm loving these days in workshops the synchronicity of who turns up when because it's so powerful, these sounds that people make to awaken in, in others and we and and in the last workshop it was it was a bit smaller so I really took the time to talk about you know to just name that fact that we are all one and we all just focused on that a lot more and I think our sound and our energy and, and I think it really added a beautiful um what receptivity responsibility you know to the group uh, knowing that we are all, you may be deep in your story, but yes, there's something for me in that, you know. It must be very rewarding to Sylvia, I would imagine, to see someone grow from oh. maybe at the beginning to, I won't, won't say the end, but as they move through some of these teachings you have, to see the changes and the growth, that mm. must be very satisfying. So beautiful. I mean, I've I've just recently working with a beautiful young young woman, and she's been to I think a couple of my one workshops up here in Walkworth, and then she's come to a couple, and and she's just a beautiful open soul who just loves sound, and she just goes everywhere there is sound, and she just is very drawn to it, and uh, yeah, because I work with these sort of performance, uh, I don't think of them as performance pieces if I call them presentation pieces, what I started to say before was I don't really like, so left brain language is very tricky because if we use the left brain words, it's going to click us back. And then, so if I say performance or presentation, they can get people all very angsty about, about, <laughs> about their piece. So, I, you know, but in the end, yes, you do have to, you know, it is useful to stand up in front of other people and, you know, have a go, you know, so... Uh, um, but boy, the shifts and changes that she's made and just, you know, over this time, it's, it's very beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And people make huge leaps, even in one weekend, you know, wow. it's very amazing. Yeah. That's wonderful. Mm. It's often during a deeply emotional state in life, a major event that we have had a cathartic experience with. Would you care to share your cathartic moment when you were plunged into deep self-examination, which led to a more spiritual awakening? <laughs> just thinking back. Well, I mean, in the bio, you link that to the end of my marriage, and I'm just thinking lots of rage, lots of rage, lots of rage. Um, <laughs> It's okay. That, Whatever comes up is fine. Um, well, I think, yeah, it just happened, you know, that the sound healing came along a few years after that. And that that was probably not accidental because I probably had, I was spending more and more time at Mana retreat center and I was doing a whole range of workshops because I knew um you know the beloved people who were who had started it and so I was getting a lot of different 
trainings and awakenings. And um, so I was sort of, you know, being prepared and stretched and, and awakened. And I guess I was probably doing that because, you know, perhaps I had more time to do it or, I, or you know, I had more, um, I certainly would have needed that sort of anchor in my life, that sort of spiritual anchor in my life at that time. And uh, and yeah, that I think that was my my sort of shift point actually. Um, and in years later, I remember looking at the date. You know, all that fuss that was made about the harmonic convergence on the such and such a day at the such and such a. And one time, I think I found, uh, you know, the exact moment that it happened in New Zealand, and I tracked it back, and it was actually my first visit ever to mana i had met the people who ran it and they said came down and it was the weekend my first visit on that land that wow. would 10 years later than that bring the sound healing to me wow the sound healing training so How incredible is that uh, that that talk about a window yeah you know, so the, the universe yeah. provided um yeah. and, and making yeah. it so easy in transition that we don't even really know time frames linearly but it's all happening in the moment which I just love yes. it when that sort of thing happens and and seeing the yeah. changes and seeing people grow mm. and becoming more into their true authentic selves um it's a such a beautiful powerful. experience it's it's sort of ridiculously powerful and ridiculously simple at the same time because you know, in in a in a in a sh sort of short explanation, the the bottom part of our vocal range are the female elements, and uh, once we get the rust off these elements, people drop very readily into their authentic self, and uh, you know we might have to go through some layers of anger and. You know, I mean, different people do it in different ways. But the fact that, you know, you can work in a group and everybody can get a level of awakening and authenticity and ownership. And groups are good because, you know, you have to do silly stuff like, you know, activate the body and shake it and all this stuff that people get a bit shy about. But that's the whole point about working with the voice and working with the body is, you know, that if you do it together, you don't so weird and it's all good um it's so but the instant change that happens for you know I get a range of responses I get people who find the sound and hate it find the sound who still you know take some time to arrive at it and then they might come back for another workshop and suddenly they're using it and they're doing it and they go who would have ever thought you had a problem with that you know um because it's just in them they've taken it away and something has connected enough that they've invited it into their lives and they've practiced it and they've allowed that energy in and um and occasionally very rarely you you will find oh or not perhaps all that really because they're the people who don't come back <laughs> but you know people will take it away and perhaps they might have had a breakthrough in the workshop but for various reasons they haven't been able to find it again and they haven't it, it was perhaps challenging for them so they didn't come back but then you know 20 years later they may I've got a woman at the moment 20 years later who's you know coming back so this is the way these things work. Um, but sorry, I just really meant to say that this, this here I am, this ability to say, here I am. And I say to them, and who has to believe that? Because the person who has to believe it is this person. And once you can be in your essence and you're willing to hear it and you're willing to speak it, and you're willing to feel the vibrations of that essence in your body, then really that can bring about great stability and um, safety and authenticity. And, you know, the people who found it hard to speak up in their jobs or in their relationships, um, it's the starting point. You still have to go out into your life and do it. But, you know, at least 
I always say is if the body has made the sound, this is how the body learns. It's totally different from the mind. We need to get completely out of the mind when we work with these female elements. So we make lots of loud sounds and we do lots of jiggy stuff with the body because we want to shut the mind up. Because as we know, that ego wants to rule the show. And to get into these deep instinctual aspects that you've been talking about, that you you experience obviously quite freely in your workshop experience, um, for some people, uh, you know, it takes a while to break through into working with those in those places with ease. But on the other extreme, you know, you you give people who've never really made sound some space to do some freeform sounding, just to say, open your mouth and let whatever comes out come out, and it's ridiculously liberating. It's quite profound for many people. And I would have to say, when I was studying in America, one of my epiphany days, if you talk about, you know, I have my list of epiphanies, but definitely one of my epiphany days was with one of the fabulous groovier younger teachers. And we basically were in a room with music for four hours, uninterrupted, being able to, in my memory, I think all we did was move and sound and move and sound and lie and move and probably sob and whatever else moved through us for four hours. I, there may have been some structure in there somewhere, I can't remember, but all I remember was this incredible liberation and... Um, yeah, being very reborn at the end of it. So I do try to put that somewhere in my workshops, even though, you know, I look forward to retreats one day because then you can perhaps do it for two hours instead of, you know, half an hour. <laughs> but I, uh, I people think, have to, yeah. I think you've said something quite profound, to be honest, that a lot of what you are teaching is so simple and yet so profound. And I think yes. the thought that when you said, I am heard and I can speak, speak my truth. And so many people go through through life that are not always heard and cannot always speak. No. Or maybe don't know how to utilize those abilities better or differently. That, yeah. is, that is such a profound statement to make. Because in but, learning how to move through that stuff yeah. and do that where they are seen, heard, and are able to speak, which sounds so simple, but in that framework is sound, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. It, well, it's so it's profound. A, it's so profound. It does. And people who just speak, who are like confident speakers, and they say, what do you do? And I say, teach voice. And they go, oh, what's that? Because... We all speak, and and there are plenty of people in the world who just lead and speak and teach and all of that without an issue. You know, there are plenty of natural speakers, but there are also plenty of speakers who wouldn't call themselves natural speakers. And um, as we know, apparently, you know, I don't know where the statistic comes from, but they say, you know, that public speaking is one of the – or the number one fear for a human being – and um, a beautiful description I was given of that is that if you imagine sort of cave, the cave human, you know, um, uh, with their club going out to get some dinner, walking up the top of the hill, you know, and, and they're alone. And then coming towards them is this, um, you know, the neighbouring tribe also out for some dinner. And it's like in that moment is, of course, the fight, flight, freeze moment. Yeah. And uh, that that is where the silencing sort of somehow gets into our system that, oh my God, it's me in front of them. And uh, what do I do? Do I yeah. fly, fly, flight or freeze? Yeah. And the freeze. And of part of that is, it, yeah. is in the growing too of self. To yes. have confidence to stand tall. Mm. And particularly as children, you know, when we've got the authority telling us 
what to do and the authority can come in many forms and we mm. don't feel brave enough or confident or courageous enough to speak out even mm. though in our heart we may know what we know is the truth but we are not allowed to speak it or whatever mm. the situation and, is and you know there's there, there are very acute um Oh, whatever you want to call it, generalizations, you know, with the people who who do, because I do think you have to be quite courageous or desperate or ready <laughs> to, to do voice work for this reason. You just have to go, yeah, I've been putting it off for years. I've got a lot of people at the moment. There is definitely a wave of people going, now's the time, you know, um, because I... I haven't been able to do this and now I want to do it, you know. And um, so I'm thrilled that, that that energy has risen high enough now that, that, that that's sort of triggering people in this way. Um, and now I have forgotten the beginning of the sentence, so you'll have to ask me now. No problem at all. <laughs> Would you please speak about transformation, which in a way we have been, mm. which you are passionate about? And the journey of soul through sound as one fractal of healing. And mm. I would say a major one after after listening to you this evening. Yeah. Well, I can't think of what I need to say about that. Um, I think we have covered quite a lot of that. Um, can you get a bit more, any specific about that or... Yeah, maybe people's transformation and maybe your own mm -hmm. in this journey. Well, I, think, of... I, think, I think that's what I was starting to say, wasn't I, before the words were taken, was, um, yes, the clients is that, so a lot of people who come might, like, for example, a very common thing is the, you know, is the silenced child through, the alcoholic parent, for example. So the alcoholic or the addicted parent, the one. So the home that has anger and volatility in it. You know, this is where it would appear that we as human beings get most silenced. And that can range from actually a fear for your life to, um, a, a, you know, just a fear you'll be whatever, whacked at or shouted at or verbally abused if, if you transgress that. But, of course, these are the deep things. I mean, we know that anger is, you know, one of the most damaging things for the child and especially, and even in the womb. Um, and it does, in my experience, having had anger around me, even though nothing like, you know, just as a, a note, really, in our upbringing. Um, but it still gets in very, very deep. And, and we learn from our parents because our ears imitate what we hear. So that's where we learn these patterns and we, we, we carry on these patterns through the generations. And we do have to make that choice to break them ourselves. So there are these very extreme scenarios of people who are generally very scared, scared, uh, real fear about speaking out, sort of, as I say, in terms of not safe to. You know, and then at the other extreme, there's a fascinating sort of, as you were saying, what we're taught by society. What so then I remember once this woman's uh, coming to mind. I think she was a younger girl actually, and she had a home where they were very, um, they they were fabulously verbal and fabulously not dysfunctional. They were all terribly successful and terribly verbal. But then in that culture, you had to keep up. You had to be clever and you had to be ready to spar all the time. So she never could find rest. And again, um, this is the fire element where we relate like this and we have the opinions and the ideas. And, it's, and so she never got to sink, find that respite within herself. And that resting time within herself and everything became fast and everything about came, you know, and society would have us, you know, this whole culture of, you know, work all day and all night and just keep going and succeed, succeed. That has lifted us out of our belly, literally out of our belly 
out of our belly breath, out of our belly sound. It's lifted us into our hypertension and our anxiety patterns. And people go, I don't know why I have this anxiety. And it's become so normalized that people have this anxiety. But, you know, I mean, I don't know the statistics, but I would just say the number of people I'd just say, can we get you breathing into your belly? Because this is going to make all the difference. And people have read it. This is what I mean about this. People have read it. They know about it. They've possibly even been taught it by somebody else. But do they do it? And I uh, work here at the in Walkworth. We have these hubs uh, once a month where people get little free healing sessions. And um, and I had a client come in and I said, oh, she said, oh, I said, oh, well, I'll just, you know, there's no particular thing we'll work on. Spirit seems to just want to give you the next. She said, I've awakened recently. And I said, oh, great. Well, well let's just look at what the next thing that Spirit would, would like to tell you in your training is. And um, and it was it was basically to get down into that belly. And and I said, have, have you done the belly breath? And she said, oh, oh yes, I know about the belly breath. Yes, I, other, other people have talk, told me about the belly breath. And I said, well, ha have you been doing it? And, uh, and she said, oh, a little bit. <laughs> But, you know, but not fully. And then I just explained to her a few what it's doing in terms of grounding spirit, allowing the channel to be grounded so that spirit can fully enter. If you want to be a healer and you don't have that grounding, it's very unsafe. So as part of our discipline as healers, we must go deep. And we must get those roots down. And if you want to go, the further up you want to go, the further down you've got to go. We know we're in this universe of duality and these are the sort of rules, you know. And then once we've gone far enough here, then boom, suddenly we're in the unity field. And that's where, um, you know, that's where we're going now. And that's a very, very beautiful place to be. Um, and that's what our sound is doing, as you say, in these experiences where our sound unifies us. And so the unify, the unity field becomes such a beautiful unity. You know, I'm thinking now of all the sound bath nights and things, which are so um, loved at the moment. And, you know, the latest groovy thing to go and have all those beautiful instruments and sound bowls and things played all around you. And, of course, one of the things they are doing is creating a very beautiful unity field for all those people there. Um, that night, you know, um, I mean, my work is, of course, different because I'm not using uh, anything other than the voice and my little um, bowl that I got in my training, which carries the three most powerful healing frequencies in it. Um, but that's as yet the only tool. And I think that seems to be people are happy with that. But, and, and, you know, there's so much to do. Uh, it's interesting, then, Sylvia, that you've dealt with sound all of your life, <laughs> obviously, mm. but learning about sound, how it affects. How do you find the emotion with the sound relates? Because we know that when people speak, they can say the same words, but with the different emotion, and you would know this well from your acting, it can have a totally different connotation or the way it is mm. said as to the way also it is heard, I guess, can vary. So would you like to talk a little bit about the emotion with the sound and how important the emotion of it is? Because it's the emotional aspect to me that creates sounds in certain ways with frequency waves with it that, that give the feeling with the sound. Can you talk oh, a bit? I, I'm probably not saying it as well as you would as a sound healer, but could you talk a little oh, bit about that, please? A wonderful, wonderful question, wonderfully described. Yeah. So um, in terms of this ladder that I talked about, um, the second element up is, is the water element, which links to our sacral to the belly. And so this is our 
our pool, really, our our place where this this deep, the feeling impulse actually originates. I mean, there's a lot of talk about feeling being linked to the solar plexus, which of course it is on another level. But we, I call the sacral. It's like for me, it's the imaginative center of the voice. Anatomically, it's not, but it is used. It's like the hara center. It's the power center. So. It does have a lot of, uh, yeah, it's aligned to, to those principles. And um, so f feeling is absolutely the core because if you, as we go through the vocal anatomy and we look at what is frozen and what is held in the body, that is going to be the breath and the jaw, the actual channel of the voice, which is the mouth, down the throat, into the belly, is where blockage occurs. And anywhere up that channel, whether it's your clenching in your solar plexus or your shutting in your throat or your jaw is in your head, <laughs> any one of these, which is ridiculously common, I have to say, um, uh, any one of these will totally prevent your ability to simply release and open sound so you know my goal is to just try to allow everybody to get to the point where they have that facility to open the channel and make a sound some people have never made a sound don't believe they can they've got all judgments about oh it's ugly but then you know these are not real qualities of judgment when it comes to sound because in these the female elements you know this is the world of Kali you know the world of chaos and destruction and rebirth so it's not about is am I sounding perfect and gorgeous yet these values are irrelevant in the world of feeling in the world of feeling as we know famous quote everybody uses emotion energy in motion so I have one of my exercises, for example, we 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 name the feeling that we have sounded and what you name it is actually irrelevant. It could be one of 10 things because there is no time to worry about the specifics or the right and wrong. It's a different value system that operates in the deep feminine. It is a different experiential system. And the only sort of rules or, or the abiding truth of the system is to allow these these are the the deep principles of the feminine that I learned and when you asked earlier about what were my epiphanies or my points of transformation in the Lichtenberg work the biggest one probably one of the biggest life-changing principles was that the feminine aspect of the in-breath and allowing sound, um, you know, we have the feminine and we have the masculine. We have the in-breath and we have the out-breath. And when it, I was, you know, always go, go, go all my life, and it had certainly had never, ever been safe for me to receive anything. And it's still something I'm having to work on daily. Um, but I am getting better at it. And... Um, and, uh, but it is life-changing once you understand, uh, we were taught, women of my generation, I don't know, people, perhaps it wasn't just women, but I think it is, was a lot women, we were taught just to go, 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 and you had to be successful, and you had to do this, and you had to be able to do everything, you had to be able to cook, you had to be a good lover, you had to do, you know, it was all these lists of things that you had to go, 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 and do, 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 and, um, and then you just get exhausted and a bit over all of it. And then you just think, okay, I just want to allow. And this allowing and this receiving and, um, and of course, you know, I spent uh, years in Australia, you know, listening to all the Abraham work, you know. Um, and, of course, the ultimate truth of that was allow 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 deep what is it to allow and that once we truly move into allowing 
um, this deep feminine principle of receiving and allowing, then the mysteries and the synchronicities and the the ease and the grace that occurs in that moment is 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 beyond anything the rational mind can describe, let alone understand. You know, they're different languages. So the voice is a direct portal to understand this language of the divine feminine. It's like the more we just and and I mean it's a, it's a meta it's a metaphorical process for me. You know, it's like as I'm teaching people to just make it sound, don't judge it, get busy doing it. The only thing that's important is 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 all of your being committed and involved in doing it. It's a wonderful metaphor for doing the life of spirit, you know, to embody, to bring it down and just to be it and do it. And it's not something that you... Be it. Words about. I had in my mind. It's yeah. just like being in the moment and gently focused on being in the moment, doing it. It is it. It is. Seems it. to be the key, doesn't it? Present moment, all the all the stuff we're learning at the moment and reading, and we've all read it for years, and it's all in the core of all the religions and the good stuff. Be it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So also, for for those that may hear it on YouTube, we talked about the teachings of Abraham. For mm -hmm. those that may not know, was that Abraham Hicks? Abraham Hicks. Sorry. Yes. And I his, couldn't it, yeah. we, I would say everyone on 5D would be aware of that, but some may not know which teaching you referred to. Yes, so thank, yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Could you mm. talk about, please, your awareness of seeing whole stories in people's bodies when you had completed the Healing with Sound training and when your clear audience mm. came online? Are you happy to talk about that? Yes, 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 but it was very funny. Yeah, I mean, I was just so amazed. I would see, I would see whole stories, and um, our trainers. It wasn't really included in the training that that any sort of we weren't trained to do this, and I think they possibly weren't happy. You know, I don't know if anybody else went off and started exploring in this way, but. Um, I just, it blew my mind so much. I just think I started asking friends and offering some sessions and, and I'm, I know for a fact, I, you know, I basically taught myself and, uh, you know, it was just probably terribly not kosher, but, you know, I mean, I was guided all the way and, um, yeah, I made some mistakes, um, and, but in the early days when this sort of came online, I would, the sessions would literally be, I don't know, I can't remember whether it was, it might have been half an hour of sounding on the body. And then the other half hour was sitting with the person and telling them everything I'd seen, you know. <laughs> and it was so mind-blowing to me, you know. Those those were the days, as I think, when any of our gifts first come online where you just go, God, isn't the human body amazing? And, you know, and I mean, it was extraordinary. But, of course, a lot of it was metaphorical language. I mean, it was like a dreamscape or a, you know, it was. And so I'm sure some of the people, they would have heard it, but they that didn't necessarily mean they got healing from it do you see what I mean for me it was amazing but I was still actually working in the realm of this newfound gift and I think the sound probably had some healing in it I'm not sure of all the talking about and telling them about it so of course basically over the years um that's gone and I only ever name anything that is directly important in the moment that we discuss and um but we're not just looking at pictures now every piece of information that appears in a healing session is you know usually pretty multi-dimensional in the sense it might just be you know the client on the table is going oh I remember that so you know 
that dad said that. And then, you know, yeah, so so he did say that. And, you know, that's got significance to something that's been said earlier in the session or a particular blockage in the ankle or, you know. Uh, so things are much simpler but more specific. Beautiful. Now. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. You are a mystic and a follower mm. of the mystery schools, utilising alchemy that exists in theatre, art and literature, and also cognizant in the ancient knowledge of the Indian Vedantas, Indigenous teachings, Buddhist practices, and the teachings of the Christ. Now, I know this is a huge area of exploration and understanding on all levels, but would you be kind enough to speak of some of these understandings and how some of these teachings are evolving in your life now? So you can go where uh, you will with that one because that is a huge yes. topic. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Take, take it where is, you and will. And, and it's sort of a relatively quick answer. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I grew up Christian, um, but it was uh, – we were Methodists, and um, what I loved about that, in my experience, probably different than my siblings, actually – is that, uh, you know, Protestantism, I mean, there was no dogma. I mean, I grew up with no dogma. I mean, my Sunday school was basically going up to the orchard with this beautiful old couple, Pop Curry and Mrs. whatever her name, um, and who would pick apples off the tree and peel them for us and feed them. I mean, this was, I didn't have the, do the, the dogma and the doctrine, so... And then, you know, my dad would be playing the organ, this terrible old Batley Watley organ. And and then occasionally we'd have a lovely dance. And there was one of his friends who used to preach and he was a really funny guy. So I, I sort of had this quite, you know, relatively what I thought was a harmless Christian um, sort of upbringing until in recent years when I've been working with a friend pretty hardcore over the last years to, you know, um, to, you know, shatter what I hope is the last of my ego and that's been quite an intense journey for several years and part of that was all this stuff she said you picked up so much you're still carrying all the Christian stuff I said but I didn't have much Christian <laughs> stuff she said well you did you know <laughs> and well you did, you did in that life where you were the matron of the Catholic um uh, you know, thing in France. And I mean, I've just had so many lives as monks and nuns and all with the poverty vow and the chastity vow. And, you know, we all have, I think, and, you know, in, in the healing community and, uh, you know, they stick, they can stick and, you know, work has to be done to, to clear this stuff. And um, so, yeah, I mean, the Buddhist, a lot of my friends were Buddhist, you know, there was that, moment and I I mean it's incorrect to say it's had a it's not actually it's not incorrect to say it's had a huge influence on me it has but my my understanding and my belief is that um I have very cherished Buddhist past lives and I never felt a need to engage with it in this life and yet when a friend happened to be living at the Buddhist um sanctuary in Melbourne in in uh, Melbourne when I lived there you know I got to go and stay there for a while and I just it was like a homecoming so I know that it's very deeply in my system without even practicing it so um, and I've had some lovely you know weekends of meditation and practice and meeting some be beautiful Buddhist souls so uh, I, I understand the the power of it and it's very beautiful and and also even less with the Indian religions but again you know I, I I it was actually one of the first spiritual texts I read when I was about 18 and it was extremely dense and I remember plowing my way through it in my first years in theatre and um you know I couldn't remember it to this day but I think again you know there's there's lineage there which I haven't gone into deeply but um 
uh, I mean, I think we just have to trust, you know, we haven't got time for all of these things in one life necessarily, but we do have, it doesn't mean that you haven't um, become imbued with them in other lives. And uh, they're just resonances for me. I see them as real. And um, I do feel very strongly, generally, I do have uh, quite strong, I mean, I know the Aboriginal, when I was in Australia, you know, had quite a strong resonance for me. And um, and uh, at the moment, you know, I'm working with the Kogi, uh, which are the tribe in the Sierra Nevada in South America, who interestingly live by the principle of the four elements. So I feel like I'm having this very profound homecoming, uh, studying with them at the moment. It's so extraordinary. It's like it's a full circle, like, you know, some reader in Nelson or somewhere, you know, 20 years ago, he said, oh, I was going, well, what's my work called? And he said, four elements voice. And I said, oh, really? And he said, yes, definitely, four elements voice. And then and then over the years, I thought, should it be five or anything? And he said, oh, no, that guy seemed to be really strong about it being four. And then here we are, and I end up back with a Kogi, and they go, it's all about the four elements. Wow. And we live by them, and we breathe them in our lives and this is what fire is in our life and this is what water is in our life and we revere these and these are our sacred teachings and and our sacred practices and it's just so profound for me to be understanding these that yeah just to have a culture who totally says yeah these are the real truths of the embodied human being is these are our anchors these are given to us as spiritual anchors these elements and um yeah but this is beautiful and it's it's like westerners are having to come back to a spirituality mm -hmm. that has been covered over and rusted if you like and in your words as well where the the easterners are having to learn more the practicalities and the technology which they are exceeding in amazingly well. And so we're getting a blend to be more whole, like we've got the dichotomy of each on each side, but it's like we're having to learn the other part of the story. But also yeah. knowing that um, we've had so many lives before and we've been so many things and so many people in so many different places, it's a whole melting pot, but it's – it's a wonderful time to be alive, isn't it? Because oh, we're learning so many fun. new skills on every oh, level. So extraordinary and so fast. And yes. so these veils just lifting and lifting and lifting. It's it's just, and yeah, I was listening to somebody the other day and I think I listened to her about six months ago. I said, oh, wow, that's, that's amazing stuff. Oh, and then I was listening to her two days ago and I was going, yep. Yep. And I thought it's like that's how quickly, you know, that these new teachings are entering us and being integrated at the moment. Yeah. Yes. yes. Mm. So you've taken clients, you run healing workshops, and also run a galactic circle in Walkworth. How do you say that word? Walkworth? Walkworth. Thank Walk. you. Walkworth. Probably and like introduce it. people to the energy of light language. May I ask how that circle is progressing with the awakening process? Because that sounds fascinating. Well, I had a um, very beautiful awakening and, and met a very beautiful community um, by being part of uh, Helen Barnes's galactic circle that she ran in Auckland for many years. And um, I think it was when I was, my light, my light language, I was still very shy. I was using it in my healing. I'd been using it in my healing for years, but I didn't even really know what it was. And then suddenly people were talking about this thing called light language, and then I went, oh, oh, is that those noises that come through when I'm doing healings? And then I sort of put two and two together, and then, of course, <laughs> it's another step to actually just sort of be brave enough to sort of do it out loud in front of other people and then... Um, <laughs> and uh, and then of course now it's it's become I've been working with uh, some Canadian teachers for the past three years who really it's been like wall to wall light language so it's probably 
imbued quite deeply in me. And I think as a result of that, um, I I assume it was like Spirit whispered in my ear and said, why don't you, we'd like you to just try a little offering. But I think it was, I've received it more as a spiritual challenge for myself because it's about going into a space empty and opening to spirit. And I didn't know what format. I'd only known this other class. Um, and I knew that it would involve, you know, connection with our space family and um, and light language, which is what light language is, of course. Um, but I had no idea what, what, what form it would take. So, so yes, it is still a process of discovery. And actually, I have to say this, this, last week I mean <laughs> I mean what's very beautiful is that you know the whales come through um who of course are very much part of my core guidance team um I've never really heard them before but of course they're not speaking language they're just doing these sort of fabulous whale sounds when they come through so um I mean I guess you could say it's light language but uh, <laughs> they're coming through me in, in this other in this other way and um and, you know, I've seen very, very gifted light language uh, speakers who get extremely different languages and qualities depending on sort of which race and, and which which star family is coming through. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I, I just went in offering what I have and it seems actually that I, I, my light language sort of starts, but then like in the last session, it was really mostly sound. And um, it was really all done through sound and I wasn't really using so much the light language. So whereas I think perhaps in some of the other sessions I have used more light language. So I'm just uh, what I know is it's a journey, and 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 it is very beautiful, and it seems that everybody there is getting a specific holding or healing for them and for their journey, and people do go away feeling enriched and um, healed, and some of the shifts have been quite deep. I mean, the Arcturians, um, sorry, the Andromedan Council came in. A couple of times ago and they did a very very profound and powerful healing on everybody it was a very small group but they just said okay we're going to bring in healing for you all and uh so i just you know channeled that through and um everybody had very different experiences when we shared it afterwards which is why i know that it was a very specific healing that was coming through for each person that was absolutely yeah. beautiful it was an exercise in trust and and Absolutely. faith. And, and it's very kindly said that you would give an offering of how you use your voice with voice work. Would you care to share that with us now, please? Is this a good time? Yes, sure. And, and are you um, happy to do that? I'm perfectly happy to do that. And so it will be... Um, it, it will just be whatever comes through for this group. It, it, I don't know whether it's going to be tone or light language or a mixture of both. I'm not sure. And when we had a little test earlier, um, we know that some of the sound can distort. So just know if I suddenly you see my mouth moving and nothing's coming out, <laughs> just know that the energetic is still happening. <laughs> You're still receiving it. It's just that the technology for some reason isn't 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 carrying it. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just tune in and we'll just uh, bring through.
Like us all to put our hands on our hearts. And to just to think of some special person in your life who could really do with you sending out or group of people sending out your heart, healing heart energy to them now and just focus on that and send it out. And if you want to make tone, just go ahead and do that too. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. hear that or was it all funny that was beautiful there were parts that were a little dissonant Fuzzy. as in how we could hear them not what you were were mm. toning thank you so much that was beautiful it kind of reminded me of the Hathor sounds yep, yep. Have a do you have an, yep. an idea of, of who was bringing that through or is it an amalgamation? Uh, uh, no, I really just open to source. I mean, that is my thing. I don't think of particularly. I mean, I didn't in that moment. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when I'm in the galactic circle, I, I, I do know who's bringing it through because I'm focusing on that. But yeah, With your... I mean, that's not quite true because sometimes messages do come through from the ascended masters, and so I mean. Also, yeah, I'm just getting that was source energy. Yeah, beautiful. Do you have any messages that you may have tuned into for what is happening in these times that could be beneficial for us? If you don't, it's absolutely fine, and I'm not asking you have to do that right in this moment. But do you have anything that you've gleaned that could be helpful for our lovely family that are listening in? I was, um, I did, yes, start doing some channeling of Kuan Yin and, and often the guardians come through and, yeah, I mean, I could, I could just see if there's anything. Thank you. That would be wonderful. We are in times of great change. We must hold hands and journey together. Keeping the light in your heart, remember the power of the heart. Unify the divine feminine and the masculine within yourself and around you. There need be no warfare. Hold tight in unity. Blessings are all around. We simply need to open our eyes and see them. 
see the blessings, see the light. Do not dwell in the fear or the doubt or the darkness. We are always here with you. We hold you in our loving embrace of eternal power, divine love, remembering, this is your time of remembering that you are the God spark. And that little voice inside you which says, I could not be, I am not worthy. This is not the truth. We are all worthy. You are indeed worthy. It is time to claim and remember and dwell and rest in that which is your God self, the spark of you which carries God that vibrates with the same frequency as the Godhead, as prime creation itself. This is the new, this is the new path. This is the divine, shining, bright new world that we can see in front of us right now if we choose, if we clarify that our allegiance is to the heart and to the light and to unity and to serving the highest and best which is within us. You are so loved. You are loved beyond knowing. Travel safely, dear ones. All is in order. Thank you. So that was Mother Mary and the Magdalene and, and Yeshua, the three of them. Gone all goosebumpy. That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much to the three of those beautiful beings for their transmission. And thank you so much to you, Sylvia, for an amazing cosmic cuppa, don't you think? Oh, lovely. Have loved it. Love chatting with you, Jude. Are, yeah. you, are you open to some questions from our lovely 5D family? Yes, sure. Which yeah. would be great. Thank you. So before we do that, I know you've got something special happening this Sunday, haven't you? Would you care to talk about that? Sunday the 12th, is that? Oh, my God, is that the Sunday? Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, so for 5D, I'm doing a um, – just we're going to do an intro session. It's probably actually – a lot of what we've talked about tonight, but I'll try to make it different and I'll try to give you an actual, um, some stuff to actually do and to understand so you can get embarked on your vocal journey. So it's an intro session, just explaining a little bit more nuts and bolts about, about the voice and um, and then that, that will just be an intro to see, to whet your appetite in case anybody would like to come and um, do a course. I mean, I've got a, a course in person in Walkworth here on Matakana actually on December the 9th and 10th if anybody feels like coming in person but in the new year I thought that I would try something I've been resisting but which I'm curious about my first ever online teaching and that will be available to 5D people and, and to others also um, but it will be available on the via 5D and beyond platform and that will just be a voice class, but it will be online. So that will be a six or an eight week course starting in January sometime. And the okay. intro to that is is the Sunday on 5G and beyond. Yeah. Can you give the time for that, please? 7 p.m. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So that's really, really good. We'd so look forward yes, to I'd that. Love to see anybody there. Yeah. And mm. can you please tell people where they can find you? Or do you want me to read it out? Um, uh, well, you yes, you can find me on Facebook. Well, actually, you can find me on my email is really the best place. And that address Jude has. And um, uh, it, so it's Sylvia, S-Y-L-V-I-A underscore vocal vision at hotmail.com. That's just always going to be there, whatever mucks up with the technology i'm also my current facebook page um is four elements voice and you can always get hold of me on messenger if you i guess you've got to friend me first but you can get hold of sylvia rands on messenger i'm happy to um discuss any private sessions or you know arrange things 
through there. I usually, in the end, ask you to email me anyway. So, um, and my website is um, <laughs> my long-awaited website is um, is uh, the domain names. Are, perhaps you could read out the domain names, food. What what yeah. are they? Sylvia Rand, so Rand's R A N D S dot com, mm -hmm. and Vocal Vision. Both these are capitals. Vocal Vision dot co dot nz. Yeah, so they will eventually, probably at the beginning of next year, if not before, uh, be where you will find all of my courses and. The moment I put my courses up on Facebook for Elements Voice. Um, but if people are in communities and they want to gather a group together and, you know, I don't mind traveling, I always have around New Zealand, yeah. That's brilliant. Mm. Right. So if we open up to our lovely 5D family, does anyone mm. have a question for Sylvia, please? Hi, Hello, I... Ray. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank You're you so unmuted. Much. Um, oh, it's amazing actually. So much, such a new field opened, and it's really mystic and miraculous how we have been so unaware about our own inherent powers. Oh my God, this is beautiful subject. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah. We know sound therapy. We or we have been here and there but the ear and other things wow actually there was one uh, uh at one point you mentioned about ears mm -hmm. uh tinnitus and the ear ringing i read the all captions because i missed that part in which you mentioned that it is a master pot alchemist for uh, alchemy right something and the true power of the ears and you also mentioned it de it does 38 things. So is it possible to talk something about ear ringing and ear tinnitus? How exactly? Something more about it. Well, the first thing to understand is that the ear has um, what is called autoacoustic sounds. And these are actually, this is from the German teaching and their study, um, that uh, these are sounds that the ear makes by and for itself and these there are three of them and usually we explore them you know with a little bit of mystery I don't know if I should give the game away but anyway they are innate sounds and um, one of these innate sounds is a high ringing pitch high pitched ringing and these are sounds that the ear organically and naturally makes. Do you want to have a guess at what the, any of the other two might be? Uh, the, the, the sounds that exist in our ears when we're quiet, when, when, when we're in the country, late at night. There are sounds that can happen inside our ears. And because we're not taught when we're young, how are your ear sounds today, darling? Um, you know, uh, we, of course, don't know about them and then stuff happens and then, of course, we go to the doctor and everything gets pathologized. And, I mean, apologies to any um, medical people who are listening. Um, um, but, you know, there is a world of mystery here um, as well as what can happen. And um, so basically the high ringing sound is potentially natural to us. And uh, for me, I think it is definitely like a spiritual antenna. And if, so you know how part of the ascension symptoms have been high ringing sounds. It's on the list. It's on the list I saw of ascension symptoms. So um, yeah, it's like, yeah, you bet. Because those high ringing sounds are literally spirit wanting to come in and connect us with all of the stuff we've been talking about tonight. And, but we've been, they've been, it's been made wrong and it's been turned into a condition 
And um, I mean, the best example I can give is that when I was teaching in Sydney, a young guy came along and after class one night, he said, oh, look, I don't know if you can help. I've got these weird sounds in my ears. And and I think I might have just done a class where we talked about all this stuff in detail. And, and I said, yeah, oh, that's great. Okay, so the simple answer is to try to make a sound at the same pitch of the sound you're hearing. So, you know, usually they're, and sometimes we really feel we can't make that pitch but so so what I'm really suggesting is that you don't think of them as the enemy you think of them as you know beloved presences and you invite them that's what we were taught in our training to invite these resonances in because this is actually the birthing of high frequency in your own sound and once the ear is awakened to its own high, high frequency we become self-healing that is the power of the human body. So the ear is absolutely a gateway for this. And these high frequencies that that, that are called various names. And I'm not... so this boy, he went away and a few weeks later I said, oh, how are you going? And he said, oh, yeah, oh, 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 yeah, no, no, that went, that's all good. So it was like, it was fresh for him. He did it, gone. Compared to an older guy who was sent to me once and he came and he had completely pathologized it and turned it into layers and layers and layers of story. And I sort of gently, I think I was trying not to, but we finally did get into a sort of a discussion about, yes, this could be spiritual. How are you feeling about the fact that it's spirit calling you? Well, I don't like that and I don't want that and I don't. So... So it came bang up against the skepticism. So it's like you could say spirit was calling and he wasn't ready to hear the call. And it had got very, very, your, are your ears going off as we're talking, are they? <laughs> I can't hear you, so you need to un unmute. Suddenly it came back actually last yesterday night when I asked my family, uh, family for last 24 hours until this morning, I had continuously high ringing. I have tinnitus past six, seven years and I went up to Auckland Hospital to check what initially because I was not aware what exactly is that until a couple of years since I joined 5D and our group that I started getting settling. It's okay. It's okay. But it's yesterday okay. was strange it started night before like loud i literally asked my daughter please touch your uh, means put your ear to my ear to listen it's so clear it's so loud how can you not hear this or anyone and now it stopped this day not stop it may subsided today after 24 hours constantly and then as you were speaking suddenly it started again <laughs> so we find something is coming again so the the main thing is that for us is just to invite uh, well, the... What you just said was beautiful, right? To befriend. Befriend is the first step. Yeah. Just to take the story out, you know, to let it be okay. And then to invite. So try the inviting and send me a message and let me know how you go. Uh, you know, so as I say, just try to tone. about thinking, oh, <laughs> so I'm ready to sleep. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter about the accuracy accuracy of whether you hit the exact pitch or not. It's just that you're reaching up there and you're saying, Yes, I understand you you are you do have something to bring in, or you're wanting to awaken something in me. So it is like you have to sing uh do you, uh, like along with that sound, you start singing yeah, and like, tone <laughs> out loud if you can. So it's like thousands of sometimes it is like thousands of crickets singing together. Okay, okay, so that's your number two sound. So are you yes, saying it's the same one. thing? You've got crickets and you've got ringing. Yeah, or you've got ringing in all many many years. It's like many years. So the crickets are the second sound. No, it's so, first sound. I would say. <laughs> no, crickets are your first sound. And do you have high rigging as well or just crickets? Right, yeah, right ear especially. 
Yeah. Well, these are the beautiful sounds. So crickets, high ringing. And the third one is like a white noise sound. Have you got that one as well? White noise? What do you know? I, like I don't a know. Conch. You know, when we listen to the conch, you know, that sort of white noisy, staticky sort of sound. Some people have that. that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Got all three. That's super amazing. That is like super creative because they're like a creative principle and and if and if all three are around or happening at once or different ones that's beautiful that's the body really trying to be very creative here yeah so it's all good it's just thank you to channel it yeah yesterday again i doubted myself that is it okay if like 24 i used to have off and on, random, suddenly it will come loudly. I always look at around where it is coming from. It is so loud. But yesterday, for the first time, it was like more than 24 hours. And that's how mm. I contacted my family on Telegram. That, what is that? 24 hours. <laughs> more so, than 24 right, hours. Can I ask you something for my interest and my research? Because this is quite fascinating. Are you somebody who speaks with ease or speaks your truth out with ease yes now yes you are okay yes so okay so you aren't you don't in yourself feel silenced in any way you are you are uh-huh not anymore i used to okay. long ago but now not anymore okay beautiful okay so that's possibly then why it's so powerful now so I was just thinking it could be powerful because it's saying wake up, wake up, but it sounds like it's actually so powerful now. So it's probably just wanting to take you to the next level of your sounding. Yeah, but I think now I get it, but I don't speak much. Uh -huh. I, think uh -huh. I don't speak. And yeah. official places where I understand a lot of things, I feel anger like I'm, uh, I'm, I work for Maori claims and other things. I don't speak there. I don't speak my truth yeah. there, not at all. I'm super so quiet. I'm super, super quiet in a number of places. I don't go much uh, public places. I don't talk. It's only I'm so much into my cocoon. <laughs> and luckily, my work is mostly online. And so that's, that's yeah, the answer that is the expected. Yes. Yes, that's yes. the one. Yeah. yeah. So this is what it's about. If mm. the voice isn't activated, these energies have nothing to come through. You see, if if you say you speak your truth and you do clearly, but you're not, you're holding it in too, as you say, you're not going to speak it in inappropriate places or you're not going to, and you've learned to hold a lot in. So it's like the, the, the physical grounding aspect of how to bring these frequencies in and let them become part of your daily energy it's just saying, it's sort of like, just let's make some sound, do some sound, just make some sound. We, you know, we can, you could start toning in the car, for example, like, dude did, you know, um, just something to, if you could just try a wee something to break your cycle of, I would prefer to be quiet in this moment. So, ah, you're driving along. Ah, what do I feel like? And as you say, the rage. So you're in that place. Something happens at work, did you say? You get very, very angry. Okay. So as soon as you can, I have suggested people go down the corridor and do it in the toilet, but it's still a bit no noisy there. So probably better to just get into your car on the way home, if you can hold it that long, and just ah, 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 ah. Instead of saying, if you, if you, if you, if you, ah, you can add that. You can be thinking that, but what's coming out your mouth is the toning. And um, that is giving your body a big dose of, I'm allowed to have that feeling. Yeah, because at the moment, if you're not letting it out anyway, your body's getting the message that you're not allowed to have it. And it's a whole stream of energy. This was the answer to Drew's question earlier about feelings. There's a whole stream of energy that becomes not available to you. And these guys, these high frequencies, they need something to ground into. So does that is that making sense? 
100 yeah. percent absolutely thank yeah. you so much and thank you for giving me so much time again thank you Julie. Wonderful. thanks great questions great thank you uh, that was great great conversation thank you so much ray and thank you sylvia hello andy hi hi andy thank you sylvia what an awesome evening Oh, um, I have a question to do with your bowl. You said it had three frequencies in it. Yes. To know how that works. Oh, God, I don't have it with me. So, um, well, I'll tell you what it is. You know, it's the beautiful um, uh, little brass bowl, you know, that <laughs> we all have. And the Lichtenberg Institutians, when they, they went, they wanted to get once, so back to the story of they were singing in the castle and people were coming and they said, we're getting healed. And so they went, oh, my God. So then this is my understanding. It's probably all wrong, but this is the story, you know. So then they got a frequency analyzer and they started putting all their sopranos and started listening. And so they've got graphs of all these voices and they, this is where they discovered the power of high frequency sound. And so they discovered that there were peaks at one, at two, at three, at five, at eight, ringing a bell. Mm. What series? So Fibonacci sequence, divine ratio. So it turns out the human voice is designed to actually function according to divine ratio. And that is when it becomes healing. That is when it becomes self-healing and healing. So three, five, and eight are sort of the dominant ones. And they are directly linked to our ear sounds also. That's another layer. So the outer canal of the ear is designed to vibrate and receive uh, 3,000 hertz. The inner part of the ear is 5,000 hertz, and the cochlea is 8,000 hertz. So the little bowl they went into, and I the story is it was a huge warehouse, and they went round with their frequency analyzer and all the, you know, big brass ones and the sexy-looking ones and all of that. They end up in the corner with this tiny, humble little bowl, which just happens to have three, five, and 8,000 hertz in it. And wow. on Sunday, I will have the bowl, and I will... That you hear it, yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. So you can hear three distinct frequencies. No, no, it's just one beautiful tone. But I guess if you had a analyzer yeah. on it, right? You might know the machinery more than me. You being the muso, you know, I don't know how they measured it, but they did apparently. Wow, awesome! Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Great. That's fascinating. It also, um, when you were talking to Ray, reminded me that the the inner sounds, um, I've heard crickets, I've heard yeah. violins, and I've heard choirs. Yeah. So it just sort of brought back that memory of when I was hearing those things. Yes. Um, it's great if, if all our memories can come back of what we've heard because – it's just like acknowledging that the, the ear does have, we do have an inner, a world of inner ear sound. We do. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And That's it's so our, cool. And it's part of our emotional health. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing how it incorporates every part of our being, really, doesn't it? We yeah. are a resonance chamber, if you will. Totally. Yeah. 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 And it was amazing because I remember in the training, you know, after – We'd been, you know, in the country and the ear, we'd all been sensitized and we'd been listening to all this high frequency stuff for days. And oh my God, you know, going back out into the world after that, and you talk about noise pollution, that's when you get it. That's when you get what it is that we're actually dealing with every day in the city. And, you know, yeah, it was very intense. Yeah. Go for it, Andy. Just on that note that you've heard angels and choirs and things, if if someone can hear a particular sound like raised sounds in her ears, but no one else can, is it the spirit that hears it 
or is it actually in the air? Those three sounds are the cicadas, the white noise, and the rigging. They're actually, I'd have to find the quote from my training, but they are an actual phenomena. They are a physical phenomena. The stuff Jude's talking about, the choirs and the other stuff, I don't know, that would be another, any experience like that that we're having, I would say that would be our own personal spiritual experience that happens in that moment. As yeah. I understand it, it's the different dimensions one travels in uh -huh. um, where you're hearing different sounds, mm -hmm. like you could hear wind or you could hear violins. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to relate to the different densities is probably a better word than dimensions. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, as I understand it with my esoteric training. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I just wondered whether there was a link between uh, the choirs of heaven. So, because I have heard that years ago, it was the most incredible thing I've ever heard. Wow. And I said, can you hear that? No, no, no. It was just for me. <laughs> and ah. it was the most amazing thing I've ever heard. You can't put words to it. I just no. wonder whether there was a link to to that, but that that's cool. It's obviously another well, I dimension. I think it's beautiful. Like what you're saying is that was so beautiful, and Jude had her really beautiful experience of that too. And they mm. are very personal. But then there you go. You've both had a version of it. So, but these other sounds, you know, if we were in a group, we could all say who's had cicadas, and hands would go up, and who's had ringing. So your answer, Andy, is yes, they are within us, and no one else can hear them, but Surely if we all have experienced them, it's not like we have to hear anybody else's because we just know that the human body has the potential to hear these sounds. That is part of our equipment. Yeah, part of the wonders of this vessel. Yeah. yeah. Andy, that, that was a brilliant question. Now, we'll mm. take one more before we're about to close for the evening. Talina, how are you? Can you unmute, please? Hi. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hello. Um, that, well, you see, that just reminded me of, um, and that hasn't happened for years now, but with doing something like vacuuming, where, where you know, and I've heard orchestras and it's kind of like actually being able to listen to it and and quite some time um and you turn the vacuum cleaner off and and it stops and then you kind of like you check and turn it on and go no there they go again um wow yeah. i'm just going to ask about that is that <laughs> okay so i think that's an example of i think that's an example of the white noise sound talina somehow being a portal for your choirs, you know. I mean, this is interesting what you're talking about. I mean, I haven't personally, don't know the research on this. I'm sure it's out there. But perhaps these core sounds, the actual anatomical ones, are in turn portals for these other sounds that you guys are, you know, experiencing, you know. Because vacuum cleaner is quite white noisy, isn't it? It's quite... White, white yeah. noise. So it might yeah. stimulate that that oh. aspect of the inner ear, you see? Yep. And then it would have stimulated the inner ear, and then that inner ear might then have opened into this next layer of okay. of, of things that you had. That's that's all like an offer. Yeah. I don't know. I'll ask myself, is that correct? They're saying yes, that's that's quite that's that's a good oh. good offer. <laughs> I'll do a bit more vacuuming. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Well, you could just actually, Talina, you could just go into nature and just sit and just start tuning in, get away from all other noises if you can, and just start listening in or buy a shell. Since that was the one that spoke to you, perhaps get a conch shell or something or, you know, I don't think we can get white noise on our tellies these days with these flash tellies, but, you know, um, just and just give your ear a bit of a taste of that and see if you can start listening to your own inner ear sounds because that, that mm. might do it too. Mm -hmm. Or mm. vacuum and then turn it off and then sit and 
notice what's happening in your ear straight after the vacuuming. That might be good too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. very good. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Talina. That's fantastic. Mm. I've certainly learned a lot this evening. I know I certainly have. Sylvia, I want to thank you so much for your wisdom and your understanding. And my goodness, it's opened my mind up to a huge vista of potential that I only mm. knew a smidgen of at the beginning of this evening. You've been absolutely amazing, very gracious. And thank you so much for your giftings as well as the speaking that you've done so beautifully. It's just been an incredible evening. It really has. Thank you. Thank you. Your questions, Jude, it's really beautiful to have somebody so engaged. It makes a huge difference. Oh, yeah. thank you. Well, I think when you've got such a fascinating guest, um, and I went <laughs> down a few rabbit holes that were not written down, um, because it's such a fascinating topic. Well, so exactly. I just want to thank you. So. Yeah, yeah. Many thanks mm. for being a guest on A Cosmic Cuppa with Jude. My, my privilege. Wonderful to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you. And on 5D and Beyond, thank you, Lee, for the opportunity again. Yes, thank if you, If you're Lee. watching on YouTube, please like, share and subscribe. Peace on Earth. It starts with you. It starts with me. God bless you and good night, everybody.